Yes, that's right. It's the squeeze. I'm Logan Lockhart. That's Tyler Milliken, and it is on Primetime Sports Talk. If you're watching, it's on YouTube. If you're listening, it's on all the platforms that you get your podcasts. And remember, we're presented by Primetime Sports Talk. Tyler, how are you this week? I'm good. I'm good. I can't complain. It's getting warm out. It actually feels like summer these days. You know, baseball season is going and chugging along. Uh, you know, there's good and bad as usual. Uh, you know, from the Red Sox, or Red Sox perspective, the Rays and Yankees aren't making life easy. Um, but, you know, who expected it to be easy? It's the AL East, right? So the Rays are playing well. As we're recording, they're about to close out. I don't want to jinx it for any Rays fans. But they're about to close Logan, out. Logan, it's okay. It's okay. Go it's ahead. Okay. Say it. Right. Maybe I should jinx it. They're about to close out their 11th straight win. They're playing well. The Padres are in a win streak. The Dodgers are in a win streak. The Yankees have won six in a row. So now you have teams that are hot around baseball. And those Rays, remember we were talking last week? It's like, okay, who's the next team to kind of put up a streak like Oakland did earlier in the year? We have our answer. It's Tampa Bay. Yeah. You look at it and you're just sitting there and it's like, it feels like every single week you have one of these teams going off on these big runs. And, you know, that's not typical of the baseball season, you know, to see win streaks of this length, especially this early. But the Rays, they're doing everything well right now. What can you say? Pitching is coming through. You know, really the biggest problem with them early on in the year was the bats weren't awake. Now the bats, they're hitting. They're swinging as well as anybody. You're seeing Randy or Rosarena do damage now. You know, they're so comfortable that – they're moving off Willie Adamas, and while Willie Adamas wasn't, you know, having a great offensive year, uh, he's someone who's produced on that side of the ball before, so it goes to show how the Rays are feeling about their lineup. And we'll get to Willie Adamas, of course, and they p- called up Taylor Walls, who's had a very nice series in Dunedin. It's been a horrible, horrible experience for the Blue Jays in Dunedin. That's their final home game as we're recording. It's happening right now in Dunedin, then they go to Buffalo, your favorite ballpark. TD Ballpark, what are your impressions? Let's give it one last send-off here. Your impressions of TD Ballpark in Dunedin. So, you know, I've checked in on the Blue Jays games throughout the year, here and there, an inning, you know, inning there, you know what I mean? But I had never sat down and watched, you know, two or three games in a row, which I got the chance to do now that the Red Sox, you know, were just down there at TD Ballpark. I can't believe they've been playing there all season. The way that ball carries out of that ballpark is its just not fair. Uh, you know, you put anything in the air to, like, right center, it's over. You're seeing blasts that shouldn't even make it to the warning track carrying out. Uh, and that doesn't include left field where, you know, you're playing at 7 p.m., you have the sun right in your eyes. And I felt bad for, uh, I believe it was Lourdes Gariel Jr., who uh, ended up getting a really tough break uh, on a single hit in. And, you know, it didn't end up costing him anything. But you could see he was terrified. He didn't know where the ball was whatsoever. And, for a Major League Baseball product, that's just not right. And it goes to show why they're putting all the work they are in Buffalo right now to make sure stuff like this doesn't happen now that, you know, starting in June, things flip. So there you go. The first homestand for the Jays in Buffalo, quote-unquote homestand. They're going to see the Astros, the Marlins, the Yankees. And you can't buy tickets after that right now. Those are the three series that you can buy tickets for. I've heard mixed reactions out of uh, the people in Buffalo about getting tickets. It's not the easiest thing in the world. But yeah, they're putting in a lot of work into that ballpark. And it's just one of those unique years where a team's playing in two different ballparks now. So technically, in Major League Baseball, we have 31 different ballparks, 32 if you include the vacant Rogers Center. So this is a real unique experience. And I was interested to see what you had to say about the ballpark, seeing the Red Sox there last week. It was, I couldn't, I just watching those games, watching the ball carry out. And while you can go ahead and say, well, the Blue Jays lineup benefits off of that. Of course they do, right? We know that lineup's potent with or without George Springer like they are right now. But for a Blue Jays team that pitching wise, it's just been a real kind of battle for them as the year has gone along in both the bullpen and starting rotation. You're basically, they're cursed in that situation, having to pitch in that ballpark for, you know, when your pitching staff's lackluster, you put them in the most really Homer happy ballpark in baseball right now. What do you expect the results to be? I think that speaks a little bit just, you know, for where the Blue Jays are at, you got to give them a little bit more credit, even though they've been kind of scuffling lately. Um, and, the, you know, they're not falling out of it by the AL East by any means, but you see the Red Sox, the Yankees, and the Rays kind of taking off a little bit. Uh, I think the Blue Jays just getting to Buffalo will be nice. And, you know, hopefully by the end of the year, they're playing games in the Rogers Center again. Hopefully, hopefully. I don't know. I don't want to speculate. It might not look good, but I don't know just yet. And you know what? With the Blue Jays, that bullpen overachieved in April. 
And by the way, TD Ballpark, everyone's calling it a minor league park. It's, it's not even a minor league park. It's a spring training park. Okay, so you're a level below at that point as well. So the pitching was good early. It overachieved, in my opinion. And now you're seeing what's happening. Now, when it comes to Willie Adamas, and let's get back to the Rays here. They bring up Taylor Walls instead of Wander Franco. Everyone wanted to see Wander Franco. When the news broke, Willie Adamas on his way to Milwaukee. They're thinking it's Wander time. That didn't happen. But Willie Adamas out. Typical Rays move. We kind of saw this coming. The Brewers take advantage. Yeah, listen, I, I got to give the Brewers credit. This is just one of those moves where the Rays were in a situation where they have Taylor Walls, uh, Bruhan. They have, you know, Wander Franco. We, they don't have a choice. Their hand is being forced. And I think if you ask them, like, if you could have held on to Willie Adamas some way and had playing time for him, they would have. This is a young guy, 25 years old, uh, between 2018 and 2019. I pulled his stats up right here. Um, you know, this is a guy who's not below average at shortstop either. It's not like he's playing out of position or anything like that. Um, but between 2019 to 2020, he slashed 256, 321, 434, 755. That's a 105 OPS plus with 28 home runs and about a 208 game span. Teams would kill for that kind of production at shortstop especially a young shortstop who's under control through 2024. But when you have, you know, so many riches, eventually sometimes it burns you. Um, and in this case, the Rays a little bit, they just had to make the move. And I, they got stuff back. Don't get me wrong. It's, you know, no disrespect to them for a bullpen that badly needs some help down there. Um, am I in love with Drew Rasmussen or, you know, I, you know I'm not going to jump off the wagon or go anywhere crazy about that. But you got Fire Ison too. And Fire Ison's had some nice moments early on with the Rays already. But I think in this deal, the Brewers just took advantage. And uh, I give them a lot of credit. They actually have a shortstop that should be able to hold it down for the time being. It's a good baseball trade. That infield was already really good defensively. The Brewers are a good defensive team. Willie Adamas is only going to help. So good for them. Now, do we have a no-hitter problem in Major League Baseball? Because in 2012, this is the year I always think about. There were seven, including perfect games. We already have six in 2021. Now, that's alarming when we're in mid-May, but at the same time, I mean, it's not as though we've had years where the all-time high is five or four. Okay, I mean, we've seen high frequencies of no-hitters, but it's alarming when we're in May. Yeah, you know, I look at it and it's like the no-hitters are definitely concerning, but I see people kind of trying to change the narrative. They're like, well, it's happened to three teams, right? We're looking at three teams right. here that are getting no-hit. Listen. The issue is obvious when you look at the league-wide batting average right now. It's in the 230s. That's just not good for the sport. Pitchers are just so much farther ahead than hitters at this point, and it's scary because, like, you know, we've had these conversations on this show just talking about moving the mound back and different stuff like that, but we know that's a ways away before you could even kind of put that into place, and hitters are just falling farther and farther behind. I'd be shocked at this point if they don't shatter the no-hitter record this year. I don't see how they don't do it at this point. You're watching games consistently go deeper and deeper. And, you know, we're not including Madison Bumgarner's seven inning, no, you know, unofficial no hitter in that conversation either. We're not talking about Sean Manaya, who was in the eighth inning recently, Nick Pavetta, who was in the sixth inning. You know, there's been guys who've gone deep this year and come close. And I'm just looking back. It, it sucks to see the no hitter lose what made it feel special. Because when I watched Spencer Turnbull and when I watched Corey Kluber throw both of theirs recently, it didn't do anything for me. It felt like I watched a guy throw a complete game shutout. And I was like, oh, you know, that's great. But by 3 p.m. the next day, whatever, you know, I'm on to the next thing. In the past, it felt like you'd think about a no-hitter for two weeks after it happened. You know, you'd replay it in your head. You'd want to, you know, it was the number one thing on Center the whole day. It's not like that anymore. And I think when you take away that magical part of the game, it, it hurts baseball a lot. Yeah, I'm 100% with you. There's something about having it in high regard within the sport. And like you said, Sports Center, perfect example. Number one on Sports Center, it's the headline story. And I'm over the moon for Corey Kluber and Turnbull as well. But, you know, even Urias with the Dodgers yesterday, he's got a perfect game going in the sixth inning. I got the alert, and I still tune in. Yes, but I think we're waiting for that perfect game. I think that's when it's going to change a little bit. We're seeing these no-hitters already walked one or two guys. He hit a batter. We need 27 up, 27 down. No, exactly. I, I've been waiting for that throughout this year, and I think that's the one thing you could still look at. Like, you get that perfect game notification from, you know, the MLB app. That's going to get you excited again. And 
you know, it, it sounds weird, but you know, other sports don't have these kind of things. Usually, you know, these rare, no hitter, perfect game kind of size them. You know, there's some in other sports that come close, but I feel like when you think of no hitter, when you think of perfect game, it's just a certain level of dominance, a certain level of special that you can't recreate anywhere else. Um, and, you know, I, I'm curious to see who throws the first perfect game of this year. It's coming. You know, it, it's going to happen at some point. Uh, and it could be anybody, just like we've seen, you know, Philip Humber, whoever it may be, that ends up getting the job done. But uh, at this point, the perfect game has, you know, the no hitters kind of lost its value. Now I kind of move the perfect game into that sole possession of, you know, a special, truly dominant performance. And I hope baseball figures out a way to make the no hitter feel special again. But right now, at least for this year, I have a hard time seeing that changing. That's where I am. The perfect game is now in that new regard. And, you know, really, when you think about it, think about no hitters, right? And we've saw seven in 2012. Okay, if we don't break that record, everything's okay, right? I mean, we can just forget about this conversation. That's what I'm thinking. We're anticipating that they're going to break the record. They haven't yet, though. And I think that's it. If they don't break it, is this conversation relevant? No, but... It, it may sound weird. I'm really hoping they do break it because if they do break it, it's going to force major league baseball's hand to do something. And unfortunately major league baseball has shown again and again, they won't do anything until their backs are against the wall until they're panicking and, you know, feeling like they have to make a drastic change. And at this point, it's not even about the no hitters. It's about just offense in the game. It's about the batting average. That's what it's about. You know, you can sit there and throw it on the Mariners or the Indians and say, or the Rangers and say whatever you want, but you can't ignore that batting average across the league. And that's where the problems, that's the root of the issue at the end of the day. What about the whole idea of hitters adjusting? And eventually it's going to come somehow. I mean, you see more guys kind of beating the shift in some ways. I mean, I watch Nate Lowe. With the Rangers, he has maybe the most opposite field hits in the league, and they shift them every time, but he beats it. Yeah, I, I look at Nick Madrigal, who's throwing the bat at the ball and just, you know, blooping it left and right, and it's so much fun to watch. It's so refreshing to see guys like that because that used to be, you know, you saw a couple of those guys on every, you know, starting lineup 10 years ago. Um, but, you know, where they are right now, it's just like, I, I, I don't know. It, I, I have a hard time really going like and seeing you know I look at Nick Madrigal and I look at these different guys like beating the shift goes so much in terms of you know moving past pitchers but the gap isn't that small anymore it's not even just the shift in that way it's there's a hitting philosophy problem in the game where it's selling out its power it's you know strikeouts it's just a different mindset and it's going to take a while because this generation of hitters that is in the game right now this is everything they've been taught uh so I don't know how long this is going to go. Is this going to be something we see for the next 10 years? I think there's a real chance of it, but something has to go one way or another. And I don't have a lot of faith in batters in hitting to make that adjustment if they haven't yet. Yeah. And you also got to think about the rate of the shifts that are happening in the minor leagues. I mean, it's not as substantial as we see it in the majors. So guys are coming up. They're not used to this and now they got to deal with it on the fly. And that's very difficult. Right. I mean, when one style of game is being played and it's being played differently somewhere else. Right. I mean, it's just like different kind of baseball. And that's not what it used to be. We used to just have baseball and that was it. So I think that's the big difference when we really think about it. How about a good story? Scott Kazmir. Um, how about this with the Giants? Right. I mean, the last time he pitched was 2016. And we all know Scott Casimir. I mean, even you and I, AL East watchers, we remember him with the Devil Rays, right? Scott Casimir. And here he is. And I thought it was an incredible story. 2019, during the All-Star break, I believe the story is he just picked up a ball and started playing catch with his buddy, and he just missed the game. And he, he rediscovered his love for it. And he's been on the Giants' radar ever since. He got signed out of spring training. He was willing to report to AAA, and now he got his shot. And this is an incredible story for Scott Casmer. It's crazy. You know, it feels like Scott Casmer is like almost this guest on like a, a, a reappearing guest on a show where, you know, every couple of years you're like, oh, yeah, I remember Scott Casmer. And then all of a sudden he's in the game. And you're like, he's back. Like this guy's still doing his thing. And, you know, we've seen it. The first real kind of breakdown when he was with the Angels back in 2011. and. You know, he kind of stepped away from the game once again, comes back. He put some really solid years together for Cleveland and Oakland and the Dodgers. Um, but, you know, 
after this last break, I don't think anyone saw it. It's been five years since this guy's been in the big leagues. Um, and like you said, he picked up the ball in, you know, 2019. Last year in a pandemic, he was playing in uh, indie ball, doing his thing, you know. Just think about that as a whole. Most people weren't even, you know, going outside their house. They were staying inside and said, this guy at, you know, age 36 is like convincing his family, his friends around him. No, I, I'm trying to be – I want to be an MLB pitcher again. Like, that is such a crazy part of the sport. And you can't do that in a lot of sports. And, you know, who knows how this is going to go for Kazmir. We've seen the Giants. They've had one of the best pitching staffs in all of baseball to begin this year. And he looks solid in his first start. Uh, we'll see how it goes as the year goes along. And we know what Kazmir – really what's killed him the last two times he's been in the big leagues is the stuff has kind of fallen off at some point. He's lost velo, and it's kind of back to – all right, I'm no longer pitching like I did when my arm was fresh, like we saw in those years with the Devil Rays, like we saw in those years with the Athletics and uh, the Indians, um, where you just saw the stuff tick up again. I hope it sticks, but more than anything, I'd love to see him just go out on a high note in his career because this is one of the you know pitchers you look at. He may never be in the Hall of Fame or anything like that, but he's the example of what it's like to be a grinding baseball player for you know 2004 to 2021. That's 17 years. Exactly. And let's hope it's not just a one-off kind of, he pitched four innings. Let's see him again. Right. And if Gabe Kapler is comfortable in him again, like you said, the pitching staff has been really good at the giants. So you can't be fooling around, but you, you, look, you listen, Gabe Kapler's face is Scott Casimir back when he was with the Red Sox. That's you know? right. like, yeah. How crazy is it kind of think back all those years and you know, Casimir was obviously a young gun at that time trying to make his way into the big leagues, but it's cool. It's cool to see pitchers, you know, me and you watch when we were kids, still work. It's still grinding. It's, it's one of the, my favorite things about sports. And I hope Casper makes the most of this opportunity. Yeah, it's like a band you used to listen to. And then years later, you see them appear wherever. Oh, they're still making music, right? And it's one of those things. So it, like you say, reappearing. Um, and it's a cool feeling, isn't it? Especially you remember him in a Devil Rays uniform. And now you see him back here. And every time he's come back, he looks completely different. The dude has locks now, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, it, it, he just reinvents himself in different ways. And I, I give anybody credit who's willing to climb that mountain time and time and time again because we see how many guys get beat down by this grind and retire, whether it's in the minor leagues or the big leagues. Um, you know, look at Ty Buttry, a perfect example with the Angels this past year. Just, this is a guy who was young. Things were going well. He had some obstacles in the minors, but he just, playing baseball is so mentally draining and for a guy who's been beat down twice like Scott Casimir all the credit in the world to him yeah and let's not forget he was one of the first guys that built up the core of the Rays rotation you know the, the rotation that was so good from 2010 up until now but you know he was one of the pioneers of that whole idea of we're just gonna build pitching here and then you saw a guy like Matt Garza come along and James Shields came along and David Price came along and he was one of the first guys uh, in that system who really made a name for himself. And of course, a world series appearance in 2008 and uh, with the Ra right for the Rays. And, you know, you think of Scott Casper and going back a few years of them, but how about Mike Trout? And he's down. This is not good. Um, I was concerned right away thinking, okay, could this be more than six weeks? That's obviously the real concern. Forget the Angels for a second, right? Because they can use them in the worst way. But for the sake of Mike Trout, this is concerning. Yeah, listen. Yeah, I, I'm not panicking by any means on Mike Trout and, you know, what the second half of his career is going to look like. But you can't deny, you know, last year it was a shortened season. But in 2019, he missed time. In 2018, he missed time. Now 2021. We know even in the shortened season, he was dealing with nagging injuries and he said he never got right. Um, it's scary, you know, for a guy who part of his game is that athleticism, you know, how hard he runs the bases, that speed. And while he's not this, you know, he's not stealing bases like we once saw him early in his career. Still, you know, that's pretty elite sprint speed he has. We see it in the outfield. It made a really nice catch about a week ago. Um, but like he said, he was running the bases. He felt that calf pop. And, you know, those things are tricky to come back from. They can really act up. And if something, you know, while he's rehabbing pops up again with that, we're talking about most likely he's done for the year. Um, and it's just tough to see. And listen, Angels fans, you probably didn't need me to tell you this, but your season's done. Uh, you know, it was not looking good when Mike Trout was healthy. Uh, but now you see it. They're looking. They're trying to figure out different ways. Joe Madden's already looking for Joe Adele again. And we know Joe Adele, he's not even having that great success at AAA, and he was rough last year. 
there's not help coming, you know, that's going to make a drastic difference one way or another. And I feel bad for the angels. Cause even, you know, with Perry Manisan, it's another year where you thought they were making the right steps forward. They're in the same spot. They were, you know, the past three or four years. And it's always the pitching argument. Well, there's not enough pitching. And now in free agency, everybody's looking at the list of free agents and they point at the best pitchers and say angels because the angels got to sign them. But, you know, the angels have been throwing out big money in free agency. Okay. I, you know, Rendon, that was a huge acquisition. Huge. And listen, Rendon, what do they do? He's out there banged up and he's playing. You know, you could see it. He's not running the base as well. He hasn't really been healthy. You know, he already missed time this year, but rushing back to get in the lineup, it's just they throw money in the wrong spots. Um, and unfortunately now Mike Trout, you know, he's still in the prime of his career, but they wasted a lot of time where he was healthy and producing. Uh, and this is one of the scary things. Players go through injuries, uh, especially a player like him who might have to figure out, do I have to play a different way at this point if I'm going to preserve my body? Um, and that will take away some of his value. We know, you know, the center field ability has kind of declined in recent years. It's just another little thing pointing down for Mike Trout where, you know, listen, he's not falling off a cliff anytime soon, but will he no longer be the undisputed number one player in the game? We're getting closer and closer to that territory. Absolutely. And obviously the stolen bases, that's another thing you point to. That's gone down. And maybe that's what the thinking was. How can I preserve my game going forward? Don't steal as many bags, right? But we've naturally seen center field. You know, he, I mean, there was no doubt about it. You're taking him in center field. End of story. I don't think it's really like that anymore. I mean, we'd rather have him or Bellinger in the field strictly. Bellinger, uh, you know, I, you could think he's below average out there and, you know, it's Mike Trout. So, and he, you know, he's still a younger guy, you know, he's not on the other half of even 30 yet, but uh, he's not 30s right on the horizon for him. Uh, and you got to just start to look at your career differently. I'm curious to see how he starts to take a stand with the angels. Like, listen, as nice of a, or as nice of a guy as Mike Trout is and everything, you got to kind of be looking and like, most likely my best years are behind me. I still have some great years ahead of me. Um, are the angels ever going to build anything around me and or properly build it? Let's say, and I have no faith in them doing stuff if they couldn't do it before. And, you know, obviously new front office kind of reimagining things. I still just can't justify them not giving themselves enough pitching depth this year. And they had everything break right with Shohei Otani to begin the year, which is even the worst part. And now, his velocity is starting to decrease and starts. And I have a hard time seeing him stay healthy throughout the course of the year because they're running with this method. Oh, just tell me, Otani, when you're not feeling great. Yeah, that, that, that's that what it is. It doesn't work. That's never going to work over the course of a full season. And, you know, the pitching for me, in my opinion, it, it's a lot better than maybe the numbers say. You know, a guy like Canning, he, he's got to be better. And he should be better. Um, Quintana, I know it's not the same Jose Quintana. He's got to be better. All these guys, okay, Heaney, another guy, right? So the pitching on paper, to me, it was like, okay, you can go into this and contend for the division crown, and it's not looking even close to that. No, and think about Dylan Bundy, who was electric yeah. last year. You know, we were all, all looking like, oh, they found like a solid number two, number three guy they can hold on. He's been terrible this year. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just, unfortunately, they're just not hitting. It, they need, need to hit on the right guys. And the biggest sin of it all is they don't have an ace. You do not have an ace. And in this game, if you don't have an ace, you're not go going anywhere. It's just what it is. Um, you know, whether, look at the Dodgers. They have three, four aces at a time. You know what I mean? If you can't compete with that, then what are you really doing here? You know, and no one's going to have four aces, but you need to have at least one. And that maybe sets the tone for a Dylan Bundy. That allows a Griffin Canning to take that next step. That takes pressure off a of Jose Quintana, who we know is not a top, top of the rotation arm anymore, but he could be a four or five and still get the job done. It's just they don't have the right foundation there on the pitching side of the ball. And it goes for the bullpen, too. Oh, the bullpen has been a big disappointment. Iglesias, a huge disappointment in the pen. That was one of the acquisitions that you can point to the front office and say, good on you. That's a good acquisition you made, and it hasn't worked. So I don't even know if it's – is it bad luck at this point? Because I look at it's them and I say, you know, that, that's a good move. All right, go into the season of that. You should be good enough with that. I'd say it'd be bad luck if this wasn't a yearly thing. Unfortunately, this has happened year in and year out. Um, and, you know, you look at it, listen, you got to have some hits with pitching, right? Like they're not hitting anything pitching-wise. Uh, and I, I look at it, and it's not to throw it in the face to anyone, but look at Bloom. 
We're talking Martin Perez. We're talking Garrett Richards, and we're talking Nick Pavetta. It, you got to hit once. You got to hit one time, and the Angels can't hit once for what seems like years. Yeah, you know what? There's nothing really else to add on to that because it's go- happening over and over again, right? I mean, again, it's not fluky. Clearly, there's a problem, and it just it's a real shame that you got to look to 2022. And, yeah, it's May 24th, okay? I mean, the Angels can go on a run. I don't know. Um, I like their lineup enough. I know there's some injuries in there, but I like their lineup to carry on some things here. They got a big two-game set coming of Texas this week, and that's going to be telling, okay, against the divisional rival. Texas has played pretty well against the Angels this year, especially in Anaheim. That's going to be a big-time series for them. I mean, I know it's only May, but there are such things as big series in May. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm looking at them. The Rangers, they've been playing some better baseball recently, you know, coming off an electric series where Garcia is just, you know, opening everyone's eyes again and again. I'm just looking at the Angels, and, you know, we're, we're talking. I, I, listen, are, are they going to be the worst team in baseball? No. Uh, but could I see by the middle of the summer, they're kind of starting to look at it. You know, Anthony Rendon's banged up, take a month off. Mike Trout's not hurrying back anymore. Shohei Otani's not pumping high 90s. He's throwing in the lower 90s like we've seen. You know, they take a step back in that way. And by that time of the year, you're probably seeing Joe Odell, you know, in that outfield trying to figure out what it's like to be a big league player. And I feel bad, you know, you look at a David Fletcher who, you know, is still over there and he's a very productive player, Justin Upton. There's solid veteran pieces still over there. It's just it doesn't matter how solid your lineup is if you can't get outs. Uh, and especially, you know, in the AL West, or in the AL West, the Astros aren't giving you any breaks. The Athletics aren't giving you any breaks. And then before you know it, the, or the Mariners are breathing down your neck. You know what I mean? And we know what the Rangers are, but, you know, at least you can look at them and you see some exciting things are trending in the right direction. I look at the Angels, they're trending in the wrong direction. Yeah, and the Mariners are going to be better as we go along here. They've really struggled as of late. And as a result, the Rangers are now in third place. In the AL West, the Mariners are below. I don't expect it to be like that. And you know what? I would still be shocked at this point if the Angels were in last place in the AL West. I mean, I can still see them being in a position where they can string some wins together. I still expect the Rangers to be in last place. But the more and more I see Adolis Garcia, that's not going to happen because he sparked this team in such a way that we haven't seen since, well, I guess last October, for Randy Rosarena. But those are substantial sparks. And Garcia, we've talked about him on the show, the most surprising rookies. I mentioned Garcia, and I was only saying that out of the idea of, hey, the Rangers put him in the cleanup role. He's batting fifth a lot of the time, but he's really held his spot in there. He's got some power. He's got some speed. He looks good in center. I didn't expect this, though. And, and I expect his average to plummet a bit, but those power numbers look for real. Listen, nobody expected this. This guy was DFA'd a couple months back. You know what I mean? And he wasn't on the major league roster until April 13th. Uh, so, you know, you look at it, I think even their eyes are opening. But this is a guy who had nice pedigree coming up in the Cardinals system. And there were high hopes for him. And it just never clicked. Um, you know, you look at the Cardinals once again. You missed on Randy Arozarena. You missed on Garcia now. It's like they, they search and search for these corner outfields, hoping that they find someone to hit and, you know, be everyday players. and you know, I look at the Cardinals, I'm like, e, you know, this, is, this might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. But for the Rangers, it's nice to see some things finally clicking with them, with Lowe now starting to really hit well this year and, you know, popping when you're kind of watching him. The starting rotation has had some bright sides too, which has been a disaster uh, for quite some time. Now I know Kyle Gibson has uh, impressed me quite a bit after a really rough start to the year. Um, and that bullpen has some exciting parts to it too. And they carved up the Red Sox when they were playing each other. Um, but yeah, listen, where the where where Garcia fits in, I don't I don't know long term. I don't want to get overly excited, but this guy looks like a product a productive MLB player. I don't think he's going to be a superstar or anything like that. But productive players are what the Rangers need right now. They need guys they can pencil in the lineup for a couple of years and know they're going to get good, uh, pro, you know, get good at bats, good defense impact different parts of the game and build a culture and you're watching Garcia that walk off home run and he's talking trash to the catcher as he leaves home plate you're seeing the team rally around him and have energy and the Rangers haven't had energy let's be real what six seven years at this point it's nice to see that fan base have something to root for 
Exactly. And you know, at the very least, we might be looking at a 2021 All-Star in the American League outfield. We might, right? Because time's kind of ticking on that. And the more he hits, right, the more he's going to get votes and the more he's going to find him way uh, on that team. Yeah, listen, every ball club needs an All-Star. We know that. <laughs> you know what we I know mean? That. Uh, and Garcia, he, he's fitting that mold. He's, listen, for a guy who's rookie of the year eligible, now you're looking from a number standpoint, you know, let's not get it crazy here, but numbers wise, he's in the MVP race right now. Yeah. Uh, will he be there by the end of the year? Most likely not. But the fact that you could say this about a guy who was DFA'd earlier this year in organizations, his own organization and the Rangers gave up on him. There you go. It's another great story going on right now. I hope Garcia keeps swinging it because, you know, I love the electricity he brings to the game. He's what I'm starting to love watching, you know, across the league. He's kind of right in the middle of it. Yep. And uh, he is a bit of a free swinger. He scares me sometimes in a big spot. He, he really, you know, goes for it. I, I wouldn't say he's all or nothing. He can put the bat on the ball, but he is a free swinger. Um, and his chase rate is relatively high. That said, right? But you look at the numbers. And when you have 14 home runs and you're tied, with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Shohei Otani, you know, we're going to be talking about you. And Adolis Garcia, absolutely. Now, Mookie Betts, this is someone who isn't so hot. And um, where is your level of concern on him with the Dodgers? I know he's vital to the Dodgers. The Dodgers are playing really well right now, and they're going to need it in that division, as we know. But Betts, their best player, it's just not happening right now at the level that we once expected. Yeah, listen, he's still well above average, you know, across the boards, but he's dealing with a lot of nagging injuries. He got scratched from the lineup the other day with some left shoulder soreness. I'm just looking at Mookie Betts, and listen, this is a guy, and, you know, I'm not talking about right now. I'm not talking about next year, but for a guy who's so much athleticism, so much freak athlete twitch, uh, you know, really modern-day Andrew McCutcheon, but to a different level. You know, I've always kind of seen that with this swing. I feel like looking at these injuries, you're seeing what happens when some of those, you know, he doesn't have some of that, you know, crazy athletic ability to him. And that's what's worried me, you know, post 30 for him. I think right now you just got to get Mookie Betts healthy and that should be the priority of the Dodgers. But the other thing is, listen, year in and year out, his numbers fluctuate a little bit. They did when he was with the Red Sox. We haven't even seen him match that 2018 kind of productivity again. He was great in 2019. He was great in 2020. We're talking one of the best players in baseball. But in 2018, we saw historic craziness from him. Um, I, I think by the end of the year, you'll see something that's in line with 2019, 2020. Um, but I, I think I just looked at these injuries and it's another reason I had to take a step back if I was a Dodgers fan and be like, you know, once he crosses 30, I, I'm expecting some regression coming because when you don't have all that ability, it hurts his game. On the bright side for the Dodgers, Cody Bellinger looks like he is closer to returning. He's getting some ABs down, rehab games in the minors and it looks like he could be activated within the next few days. So the next time we record, we might be talking about a potential Bellinger return, maybe on the eve of it. But right now there's two things I'm really looking forward to. I want to know when Wander Franco's debuting. I know we talked about it last week, but now that Willie Adamas is traded, that's going to be a big time debut. Do you think that it will have the same excitement that it did for Kellenic in Seattle? I'm not sure. I think because it's because of the Rays, partially no. You know, I, Kelnick felt like such a buildup, and I think part of that was everything that happened with the former Mariners president and the, you know, service time manipulation and everything we saw fall out from there. Um, and I think Wander Franco, listen, he, he is the number one prospect in baseball for a reason. Uh, and I think early on, you know, there'll be a lot of excitement, but at the end of the day, it's the Tampa Bay Rays, and there's only so much of that excitement that comes from there. Um, but I think Wander Franco's play will be ultimately what makes people pay attention because he's going to go out there and he'll be, you know, I think within a year, one of the best players in baseball, you know, I think it'll be hard to dispute, especially in the all around aspect. Um, and we saw, look at the Rays with the way they're playing. You bring in, you know, Wander Franco, Bruhan, you know, walls, like there's so much more talent and it's not even at the big league level yet. You take a step back and it's like, the Rays may have more than another gear. There might be two more gears here. Um, and that's not, you know, listen, eventually they're going to have to sell off some of these riches for other parts and kind of mix and match here. Who knows what that's going to bring to them? Um, and I think the Rays coming off a really hard, like painful World Series loss last year, I wouldn't be surprised if we see them be a little bit more aggressive when the trade deadline rolls around. I think so, especially getting that taste of World Series action. It's contagious. And it is to a front office as well. Okay. 
I'm going to put both of us on the spot before we wrap up. The AL East is jam-packed. And we know that we're not in an expanded postseason year. We're back to normalcy in that sense. Who's in? Who's out? We know we're going to have a division winner. Are we going to have two wild cards? If we are, who are they? And if we're not, who's missing the playoffs in the AL East? This has been a really hard question because, you know, you look around, it's really, you look over to the AL West and, you know, whoever ends up falling, you know, Astros, Athletics, whoever pulls out there, that's going to be, I feel like the other team really fighting for that wild card. Um, I think the Astros are ultimately going to win that division. I think, you know, people don't realize how great that starting rotation is and they're not even close to healthy, you know, Framber Valdez is right around the corner from getting right. Um, so, you know, that'll be just another dimension. And I think getting another arm in there will give them another one of those rotation arms to push to the bullpen, which has been their biggest weakness. But they have the fourth best run differential in baseball, and people aren't even talking about that. I look at it. I, ah, uh, God, I, I uh, this is a really hard question. I think ultimately I'm going to take the Yankees to win the division. I think the Rays are going to get a wild card. And you know what? I think the Red Sox are going to get a wild card too. I think the AL East will end up being the division everyone stares at all summer. And they're like, you know, these teams are going nuts. They're going back and forth. But ultimately I look at the Rays and I look at the Red Sox and I like their teams better than I like the athletics at this point. Okay. I'm more in line with you and you're thinking I got the Yankees and Rays in for sure. And then I immediately think of the AL West. I mean, in the AL Central, I think we're going to give it to the White Sox right now. I think that's going to be the race. I don't think we really trust Cleveland right now to take that step and, and do something serious like that. And Minnesota's in shambles, let's be real. And Minnesota's in total shambles. I mean, if we had this conversation two months ago, me and you would have been saying, hey, Minnesota, they might win this division. The White Sox are in trouble. <laughs> no, it's the other way around. And I'm going Yankees race for sure. Agreed. And then if we're going to start having a conversation about Boston or Toronto, I will take Boston in that. Because, again, I think the Blue Jays pitching, it's overachieved. I think it's going to be a big problem. And right now they just don't have enough starters. And they have to make a move. If they don't make a move, I'm 100% sold on them missing the playoffs. I expect them to be busy at the deadline, though. Yeah, and listen, the one thing I look at, and while you know, it may not end up working out perfectly, we know coming back from Tommy John can be complicated. Chris Sale is waiting in the wings. Yep. You know, he's going to be coming in, you know, July, late July, August. And for a guy with his work ethic, I expect him to come back and be better than most pitchers are post Tommy John. I think he'll kind of get in and he's been itching to come back and they're really taking things slow with him to have that addition. And that doesn't even include, I think the Red Sox will end up adding some bullpen help at the trade deadline. Um, do I expect a major move? No, but the Red Sox, Sox may have too many starters uh, by the trade deadline, and that's just a real part of it. You go down the list, listen, Eduardo Rodriguez, Garrett Richards, Nick Pavetta, Martin Perez, Nate Valdi, Chris Sale. We're not talking Tanner Houck, who was it, you know, kicking the door down before his most recent injury. Connor Seabold, who's at AAA too. Something's going to have to give, and I wouldn't be surprised. You know, I, I've floated this idea a couple times, but – you know, none of those arms are really anyone you want to shove to the bullpen. But what they gave Garrett Richards was an extra year on top of his deal. It was one of the reasons the Red Sox didn't go for Corey Kluber, you know, and push the money like many had expected. Would it surprise me if they look at Garrett Richards and they're like, there might be a desperate team out there. Let's flip them. We have enough rotation depth and get something back for that and uh, kind of get ready for that really big push in 2022. It wouldn't surprise me one bit. That sounds possible to me. And you know what? As far as I'm concerned, when you say too many starting pitchers, that's not a bad thing. I think that's a good problem to have, especially when you know the kind of year that we're in. Having more is better than less, especially with pitching. In fact, it might only be important with pitching. And see, that's the thing. That's why with that theory, like I really want to preface it. Listen, things could fall out the sky in two weeks from now and you see you know, this guy down and this guy down. Tanner Houck and Connor Seabold both got injured, you know, two, three weeks ago. And like that, you were like, all right, the Red Sox are getting kind of thin on starting pitching again. So, you know, I, by no means am I saying that's what's going to happen. That's, I think, if everything goes right for this team. And we know how this sport works. It never ends up going that way. It is the squeeze. I'm Logan Lockhart. That's Tyler Milliken. We do this every week. It's presented by Primetime Sports Talk. If you're watching, it's on YouTube, listening, all the platforms, wherever you get your podcasts. Congratulations to your Bruins, by the way. I forgot to mention that. It must be a very happy and celebratory time in Massachusetts. 
Listen, man, uh, people are going nuts and they're really excited, especially with some of the Bruins and their choking history in recent years. Um, but to see Patrice Bergeron shine, you know, in his first year as the captain post of Dan O'Chara and, you know, really, you know, listen, a lot of love for Chara, but to kind of shove it down his throat right in front of him. And there was a lot of panic here about when Chara, you know, people were upset that he wasn't paid like many, you know, to stick around and be that kind of veteran presence. But listen, the perfection line is doing its thing. I got to give him a lot of love. I'll tell you what. And of course, Chara, all respect to him forever. We're, we're always going to respect Zdeno Chara. 100%. But his departure, to me, I looked at that and said, okay, Charlie McAvoy now, this is going to open up so many opportunities for him. And I'm a huge Charlie McAvoy fan. And he's blossomed. And, and there's probably a def- not a defenseman in hockey I'd rather watch right now than, than McAvoy on the back end in Boston. So I'm happy that he's getting his opportunity. Quarterbacking, whichever power play unit Bruce Cassidy decides he's going to be on. And the Bruins are off to round two. They're going to play either the Islanders or Penguins. Again, this is the squeeze. It's baseball talk, primetime sports talk, not hockey talk, right? No, no. But listen, if the Bruins keep winning like they are, we'll, we'll hit on it a little bit at the end of all these shows, right? Sounds like a deal. Let's do it. Until next week on Primetime Sports Talk, here we are, signing off.